lot. People say, oh, you're probably yeah, just a crutch. It you is. Know, this is uh, this, lean on exactly. It. This is a, a common expression. Is God just a crutch? So I thought maybe we could tackle that today. Okay. Actually, found a picture of a crutch. <laughs> <laughs> Seemed highly appropriate. Is God a crutch? And you're right, this is a common complaint uh, leveled against Christians. So I've given about three or four of these I want you to take a look at here. One is a former governor of Minnesota. He was an action movie star. Uh, he was in... He was in the uh, Yeah. Yeah. He had the famous line in one of his movies, I ain't got time to bleed. That was Jesse Ventura. And then he ran for governor. For some reason, the people of Minnesota are kind of uh, crazies, and they voted this guy into office. Well, he didn't have a high opinion of religion, you can tell. He said, organized religion is a sham, and it's a fake, and it's a crutch for weak-minded people who need strength in numbers. But he's too tough, right? Beat the chest. I don't need religion, right? That's just for the weak people. That's okay, no problem. Oh, somebody got a hat. Was that yours? Yeah. Okay, you got he's, it back. He's got to get back. <laughs> We just started, so you didn't miss anything. But we're just talking about uh, people that have uh, made the charge against Christianity. That that's just a thing for people who need a crutch, right? They're psychologically re- uh, weak. So we did uh, Jesse Ventura, but here are some slightly heavier hitters than mm-hmm. Jesse Ventura. Sigmund Freud, the the father of modern psychology. God is a father figure, right? You just run to him because you want daddy. That's the only reason there's a God that people think there's a God. They just need a daddy. Uh, Karl Marx. Religion is due to a devious imagination of the mind. He called it an opiate of the people. It's just to help them feel better about life because life is so miserable. And so it's it's something kind of devious that your mind just creates for you. How about Friedrich Nietzsche, great philosopher? Uh, Certainly not a Christian, but you know, he forecasts so many things about the 20th century. He lived uh, toward the end of the 19th century. And he said the 20th century is going to be the, the, the worst as far as war is concerned because we've given up the idea of God. God is dead. Now, he wasn't happy about it, but he's just saying, hey, that's the reality. He said once God is out of the picture, all bets are off. You'll, people will do all sorts of hideous things to each other, and he got it right. Well, here's what he said about religion. Weak individuals need it. So do you hear that common occurrence again and again? It's for the weak. It's for people that can't handle life. They run to daddy. But you know, if they're pointing toward Christians and saying, you weak-minded people, you're creating something in your mind because you want it so badly, that finger can be flipped around and pointed toward them, right? It works both ways, which I think is really fascinating. It's not much of an argument against religious people because it can be used against atheists. Let me give you some examples. Thomas Nagel, not a believer. He's an NYU, New York University professor. Here's what he had to say. I want atheism to be true, and I'm made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope there's no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. How many times do you hear, I want, and I don't want, and I don't want, right? Where is that coming from? It's his mind. That's a psychological projection, isn't it? He says, I don't want this, so therefore... I'll be an atheist, right? He didn't, he didn't say, I'm going to be an atheist because I think that's where the evidence leads. I've examined it very carefully. It, it's not, it doesn't work, right? There's no such thing as religion. Uh, everyone can be proved false. He doesn't say that. He says, I want this to be true. I want the universe to be like that. And he'd say, why in the world would somebody want a world without a God? What, what would be the advantage to that? Well, here's another individual who's answered that question. It's Aldous Huxley, you might uh, remember that name, he wrote Brave New World, a hugely popular book at the time, and actually some of his forecasting I think is pretty right on for what's uh, going on today. This is a long quote, but again, think about his psychological aspect here, as he is wrestling with the idea of a god or no god. He says, I had motive for not, there's that word again, want, right, for not wanting the world to have meaning. Consequently assumed that it had none, was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. So what did he start first? He started with what he wanted, and then he looked for reasons to back up his motives. Right? So that's backwards. seems like we ought to look out and find the reasons and say, okay, I will commit to this or I won't commit to this. But he's doing it the other way around. He said, I'm looking for something to satisfy me on the inside. 
The philosopher who finds no meaning in the world is concerned to prove there's no valid reason why he personally should not do as he wants to do. Right? Do you hear that? To me, that's the key part there. You look out and you say, I want to be able to do certain things, so therefore I will decide that's the way the world really is. Why he should not do what he wants to do, or why his friends should not seize political power and govern in the way they find most advantageous to themselves. For myself, here it comes back, here's his admission, which I think is really powerful. The philosophy of meaninglessness, in other words, no God, was essentially an instrument of liberation, sexual and political. If there's no God, guess what? I get to do whatever I want. If I want to get into politics and mash people down and take over and live the high life, I do that, right? I don't worry about a God. That's what Stalin did. That's what Mao did. There's no God. We can step on whoever we want. Maybe it's sexual liberation. Okay, do whatever you want. Forget morality, right? That goes out the window. If there's no God, we're just making up morality as we go along. So that was great for him. He said, that's where I want to be. So can you hear that reverse psychology going on there? It's what's in their heads. Here's one more person, Mortimer Adler, who is uh, a founder of the program called Great Books Program, part of Encyclopedia Britannica, I mean, an extremely sharp guy. Here's the good news. Adler, toward the end of his life, converted, became a Christian. But this was earlier in his life, and notice what he is saying. I rejected past tense, so I'm glad he came on board. But he said, I rejected religion because it required a radical change in my life a basic alteration in the direction of my day-to-day -day choices as well as in the ultimate objectives to be sought or hoped for. That's true, isn't it? If you become a Christian, you, your life changes day-to-day. -day. It should. It's supposed to. You're supposed to have different objectives. You're supposed to be doing things for a different purpose. He said, I didn't want that. The simple truth is I did not wish to live up to being a religious person. Isn't that interesting? Didn't want to live up to it. Oh, you're a Christian, then you better do this, and we're watching your life. He says, I don't want that. I want to be able to do whatever I want to do. So again, you know, for those people that point the finger at us and say, oh, you weak-minded individuals, you need God, you flip it around and you say, you've got your own psychological reasons to not want there to be a God. So it's interesting how that's not much of an argument against God. Somebody did some research at one time, which goes into this whole psychological thing, and I find this fascinating. It's called Faith of the Fatherless by a man named Witz. He discovered, he went through about the last two or three hundred years of philosophy and history, and, and he, he took people that were noted atheists, and he took people that were noted theists, those who believed in a God, and he examined their background. Now here's what he discovered, and I just put a few of their names on there. David Hume, uh, Voltaire, the Frenchman. These are not believers, right? People that have rejected the idea of God. Nietzsche and Camus and Freud and some of these others. And what did they... Good morning. There you go. I can't find my way. No. <laughs> yeah. What did they discover about these individuals? Or what did he discover about these individuals? In every case, something was wrong with their father relationship. Now, it doesn't mean they were bad fathers. It, it's not necessarily that they were beaten by their dads. Maybe the dad died when they were young. Uh, maybe the dad left. Uh, something happened. They didn't have a secure happy, father-led home life. And then he took the people that you may recognize a few of these names, people who did believe in a God, who were uh, strong believers. In fact, Wilberforce is the one who led the uh, fight against slavery in England. They made the movie Amazing Grace. Mm -hmm. I hope you had a chance to see that. That's mm -hmm. Okay, good. That's a great movie. So he took those people on the other side of the column, the, the believers in God, and examined their home life, and guess what he discovered? strong father figures. The dads were there, not only were they there, they were people that the kids looked up to. So do you notice how in each case this would maybe change how you would see a God? You know, if you grew up in, a, in a, some kind of a broken home uh, and, and you read in the Bible, God is your father, you know, our father who art in heaven, maybe you don't feel that close connection. You might want to walk away. On the other hand, if you had a good dad, you might say, okay, our father and I, oh, that's nice. I have a father in heaven, I had an earthly father, this is good news. But do you notice this doesn't really say whether there is a God or there's not a God. It's just there are psychological reasons probably at work in people's lives. So we're not getting anywhere if that's all we're doing is saying, well, you have a psychological need. Well, you have a psychological need. I love this comeback, by the way. If anybody ever says anything like this to you, be ready. This is a, a wonderful... A remark. John Lennox is a terrific Christian guy. He's an Oxford mathematician, so a sharp, sharp guy. 
He was once told, somebody said, you know, belief in God is just for people who are afraid of the dark. He turned around and he said, atheism is for people who are afraid of the light. <laughs> Isn't that a great line? And you say, why would you be afraid of light? Well, the things we talked about, you know, if there's a light out there, if there's a God out there, he may have requirements for us, right? Uh, and I don't want to deal with that. I want to live my own life. Right? I want to be liberated. In fact, I think this is uh, interesting too. Many people destroy that idea of, hey, how you doing? So, there you go. Thank you. Sure. Many people have come to Christ without this psychological need, this seeking for a father figure. In fact, in many of their autobiographies and many of their testimonies, they have said again and again, I came, in a sense, kicking and screaming, being dragged kicking and screaming into the kingdom. I was not pulled there because, of, gee, I just need a father figure. They were not wishing for Christianity to be true. C.S. Lewis, the famous uh, English uh, writer of uh, Mere Christianity and the Chronicles of Narnia and all, he said he was the most miserable convert in all of England when he became a Christian. <laughs> but he just finally said, I can't do this anymore. It's true. It's for real. i I got to quit fighting it. And so he kind of had his head down, but he became a Christian. Alistair McGrath, was a, again, he's an English uh, philosopher and writer. He was an atheist. He only came to Christianity because he said, I got to. It's, that's where the truth is. Francis Collins is the, uh, was the director of the Human Genome Project, so he's a brilliant uh, doctor. He was not interested in Christianity and finally did some research. He was happy with his life. He was a doctor. He was uh, appreciated, right? He was helping the, the sick and people looked up to him. Him and he thought life was fine. But he finally investigated uh, religions because of a challenge of one of his patients. And then he, he, he kind of, you know, he was looking at world religions, got kind of confused by it all, and finally read a book by C.S. Lewis and uh, converted. What I want to do is to show you about a three or four minute video here of the last person on the list, J. Warner Wallace. He'll probably say a little bit about his life, but uh, Wallace is a uh, cold case homicide detective from the Los Angeles area. So he would take these cases that people hadn't been able to solve for a long, long time, and he'd go out in the field and do a lot of work. Now he got so good at it, he was featured on Dateline and some other uh, television shows. He never lost a case. Once he got on it, he was a bulldog. And he was so sharp with what he did as a detective that they always uh, convicted the person. So he's got a, a little story here I want you to to hear when he talks about why did he become a Christian? Was he unhappy? Did he need a father figure? No. So let, let's hope, see if this will work. If not, I've got it on a, <laughs> okay, so I don't think it's happy. All right, give me a second then. I will, uh, They must not have Wi-Fi over here. Okay, so I think Maybe we're... Maybe it's got lots of blocks on it. It's got what? There's lots of security blocks oh, on there. Oh, okay, so that's probably why, huh? I have trouble playing videos for the children's ministry. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we should be able to...
He was also a loving husband, dedicated father, and an avowed atheist. I was more than happy with the idea that I would live my life, and when I closed my eyes for the last time, I would be in the dirt. And from nothing, I'll go back to nothing. I, the idea of a life after this one was meaningless to me. If you had told me that I was a sinner, I would have laughed at you. I know what sinners look like. The other folks I take to jail, that's not me. I'm a good guy. Jim always prided himself in his intellect and openly mocked people of faith, especially Christians. He thought it was a completely unnecessary mythology that I just could not be part of. Reason and observation and scientific exploration would eventually have answers for all the questions that I had about life. There was one friend who kept inviting Jim and his wife Susie to church. Susie wanted to go because she believed in God and felt their children should go to church like she and her family did. I never read the Bible and really didn't have um, much um, understanding of what it all really meant. I think I knew the basic tenets of the faith. I was the kind of person who would have been more than happy to go to church with my wife as long as I could go as an atheist. The pastor was able to communicate a message that was really geared for the kind of selfish, self-focused atheist that I was, in the sense that he was able to interest me in Jesus as a smart guy. Jim was intrigued, so he bought a $6 Bible. I wasn't about to spend any more than $6 on this. And I was looking for the real I want to see what Jesus has to say. If he's got some wisdom to share, let's hear it. Jim put his training as a detective to work and poured over the Gospels. He discovered something that in his line of work was critical to any investigation. Eyewitness accounts. If you have multiple eyewitnesses who see the same event, they never tell you the same story, but they do tell you a story that can be seen together like a puzzle. I was seeing these characteristics in the Gospels, and I thought, well, wow, you know, in some aspects, I think this stuff feels and looks a lot like eyewitness testimony. And so I was willing to take a step with it and start to examine it as an eyewitness account to see if it would hold up. This was intriguing to me because it was a claim not just about some wisdom from the ancient past, but a claim about an event that either occurred or didn't occur in the ancient past, and that was something I could test. Jim also looked into the writings of other ancient historians to verify the accounts he found in the Bible. So I think as I went through that process of digging, looking at language, looking at the template that I used to evaluate eyewitnesses, I became more comfortable and more confident that those were accurate, reliable eyewitness accounts. We were both learning so much um, at the same time. When Jim's atheism could stand in the light of the evidence, he was faced with one question. Why do we need a savior? To answer that question, Jim had to admit that his pride was keeping him from accepting the truth about Jesus. It wasn't that there wasn't enough evidence. It was all about realizing, I'm not God, and realizing that, man, I have, I'm a mess. And there's a lot about my life that I uh, would like to change, a lot that I'm not proud of, a lot that I need forgiveness for. Jim, the good guy, needed a savior too. I, for a lot of years, worked hard to resist God's spirit. And at some point, I just said, okay, I'm done. I believe it. I'm in. I submitted everything to him. I submitted everything to Christ. I submitted every waking thought. I felt like I was getting to witness a miracle. Just unfold right before. Okay, so that's the, the basic message there. Wallace. But if you email me, I can send you the link to the, uh, do you want that yeah. little clip, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I can send that to you. Okay, thank you. Sure. It's, it's at the bottom of the page there. It says, uh, for further information, contact me, Zach at oh, Cox.net. Yeah. Sure, thank I'll you. send you that. Oh, did you hear his message, though? He said he was perfectly happy. Mm -hmm. Right, he was doing uh, the work that he wanted to do. His dad was a cop. He became a cop. Eventually, his son became a police officer. So he's come from this family, police officers. He's doing what he likes. And he thinks when life's over, you know, you're in the ground, that's it. Okay, enjoy this world as much as you can. And it was by examining evidence he decided, oh, this is true. And once it's true, then he's walked through that door and he's become a Christian. 
He well, speaks all over the, the uh, world, by the way. He came to our Church Emmanuel Faith about, was it about a year ago? And he spoke, and he's, he's a powerful speaker. His first book was about the reliability of the uh, scriptures, uh, of New Testament documents. It's called Cold Case Christianity. That's good. But he's just come up with a new one called God's Crime Scene, and it looks at the universe and how there's so much evidence out there for um, design and uh, you know careful creation of the world, not just an accident. Hey, Pete. Gary, I got a comment. Yeah. Um, you see how he did feel happy, you know, glad it was okay, but then he realized that you know, he was a mess. He yeah. He was a mess. A lot of people are in that state. You know, a lot of times um, we feel okay, we're comfortable outside, and think we don't need anything. Yeah. But then we, when we get into the Word of God, you know, it reveals to us that we do need help. Yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that, that I love J. J. Warner Wallace. If you have a chance to even just see some of his things, little clips on YouTube, just type in J. Warner Wallace. Uh, yeah. You also go to coldcasechristianity.com. Oh yeah, Cold Case Christianity. Is there a hyphen in there? Is it all? No, no just cold, C O L D C A S E, coldcasechristianity.com. He has got so much material there. He comes from a Mormon family, and so if you're ever dealing with Mormons, he's just got a wealth of material there on the difference between Christianity and Mormonism, but it's every aspect of Christianity. He just wears me out seeing all the things that he accomplishes. Just He says he gets up early in the morning. I can believe it. I mean, he's just a go-getter. He speaks at conferences now. He's a very popular uh, individual. And you can tell he speaks well and uh, a, a very uh, knowledgeable person. So, Joe, uh, Warner Wallace? Yeah, J period. Like It stands for James. So J period, then Warner, W-A-R-N-E-R, Warner. And then W A L L A C E. Thank you. J. Warner Wallace. But the whole point of this part now is to say people don't necessarily come. Now, some do. Some come for psychological reasons to Christ. Some ignore Christ because of psychological reasons. And, and some people come despite their psychological reasons. He was okay psychologically, but he comes to Christ because he thinks that's where the evidence is. So I always wondered, you know these people that say, oh, you Christians, uh, you just go to Jesus and go to God because that helps you. That's what you want. You want this daddy figure. But if you really think about it, what kind of God did we invent as Christians? If we're inventing a God, is is this the kind of God, the Judeo-Christian God that brings ultimate comfort? Well, we say, yeah, he brings comfort, but imagine if you're inventing a God. Would you invent a God that's totally righteous? Wouldn't you invent a God that's a little bit easier going? It's like, oh, you messed up, but that's okay. right? I'm going to kind of weigh you. As long as you do some nice things, don't worry about the bad things you do. right? That's the kind of God I'd come up with, because I, th- I hope I think I do more good than I do bad. But you know, So I'd kind of like a God that sort of weighed me. And, um, but he's a judge. Well, I don't want to go in front of a judge. No thanks. That doesn't appeal to me at all. All those things revealed about my life. He's the one that created hell. If you're going to invent a God, are you going to invent a hell? Are you just going to say, well, you didn't do as well as I hoped you'd do. I'll kind of isolate you over here. You know, I'll put the Hitlers and the Maos over here and just let them kind of irritate each other for eternity. But, you know, I'm not going to do anything bad to them. And the rest of you tried pretty hard. Come on in. Uh, how many of those jokes do you hear about the Golden Gate? You know, somebody comes in front of the pearly gates there, and there's St. Peter, and they always have these jokes about it. It's like everybody gets to go up there. That's not the God of the New Testament. The moral standards, remember when Jesus did the Sermon on the Mount? You look at a woman with lust, you just committed adultery. Wow, that's a little tighter than what the, even the Ten Commandments said, right? Jesus says, that's not as specific. Let me tell you specifically what God's concerned with. You ever been angry at somebody? You just committed murder in your heart. Ooh. That's not good, right? You can invent a God that does things like that. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. That's not the kind of God I want to follow that tells me, pick up a cross. He says, turn the other cheek. It's more fun to whack the person's other cheek than to turn our own cheek, right? So I I wouldn't create the kind of Jesus that's in the New Testament. I wouldn't create the kind of God that's in the Bible. And yet we're, we're told that we're creating this father figure. That doesn't make any sense to me. The God that's revealed in the Bible is a much more stern God than I would have created. So it seems odd that we'd say, oh yeah, you Christians, you've created this God. So here's the real question. Here we've been talking about the psychology behind things. 
okay, Christ is a crutch for us. But the question is, are we lame? <laughs> right? So Christ is this crutch. Do we need it? Right? If we're healthy, then it is stupid. Why, why go to a crutch if we're healthy people? Right? In a day-to-day, -day, just our physical existence, we don't take crutches, we don't use wheelchairs unless we need them because there's something wrong. We have to heal up or whatever. So the real question is, do we need a crutch? And this is where I'd like to spend the last part of the class. I, I would suggest, and I hope you agree with me, we're all lame. In some sense, not necessarily physically, but how about this list, and you can probably think of 20 other things we could put on it. We all have feelings of inadequacy, right? Because even if we don't look at the Bible or don't look at a holy book, we have our own standards, and we don't live up to our own standards. We mess up all the time. We say, well, at least I'm not a Hitler. Okay, you're not a Hitler, but you have your own standards of what you think is right and wrong, and every day you go, why did I do that? I just messed up whatever my standard was. We have guilt feelings, right? We say, well, okay, we screwed up. I don't feel so good about what I did. We have self-destructive tendencies, don't we? Hang out with the wrong people and, and uh, just do stupid things to ourselves. We're full of pride. We're antagonistic towards others. A lot of envy. It's all self-centeredness. Isn't that what Jim uh, Wallace was talking about? It was all about him. And as he read the Bible, he realized, oh, I've been living just for my life. That's not so good. So I would suggest for all lame, and you could add certainly more things to this. So the question, I think the big question is, somebody throws that crutch issue at you, just say, well, I think we all need crutches. Here's the question, can your crutch hold you? So let's just try a few of these, and I want to hear what some of your responses are, especially if you've experienced this or you've seen other people who have experienced these issues. For a lot of people, their job is their crutch, right? I, I've got it for 40 years, I'm set. I know what I'm going to do every day. I'll go there, and uh, they'll pay me, and everything is, is fine. Do you know anybody who's, who's lost a job? Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, you're all nodding. You know people who've lost jobs. You know people who all of a sudden get bored with what they're doing, and they, they walk away from it. I taught at Orange Glen High. I was telling uh, Howard here. I, I taught here at the school, so every time I walk around, I go, oh, I remember walking around here. Mm. I taught here for 12 years, got totally burned out. I said, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. Here I was in school and I got this job. My parents were proud of me. Oh, you're a teacher. I said, I'm done. So this idea of a crutch, I had to come up with something else pretty fast. You know, I just I couldn't do it anymore. How about money as a crutch? Let me tell you a little story here. I just read it last night and I said, oh, this is perfect. I think God has a way of doing things like that to tie into what we're currently going through or talking about. Anybody know who Ravi Zacharias is? He's another evangelist oh, yes. and a terrific, yes. unbelievably good speaker. So he's got a book out called Why Suffering? Because that's the big issue that Christians deal with. We talked about it a while back when I was here before about uh, the problem of evil and suffering. So here's a, uh, just a short little story. He said, some time ago, one of the world's wealthiest women separated herself from her family. The owner of a 45-room mansion in New York filled with artwork worth millions of dollars she spent the last few years of her life in a rented hospital room just to be separated from the opulence and the family that was embroiled in a bitter struggle for ownership. Among her last words were these, money is poison. What she had in plenty was in disproportion to what she needed the most. So isn't that something? I, I don't know who he's referring to there, but... She had it all. She had a, a huge mansion. She had rooms full of art worth a fortune. And she ends up leaving it all before her death just to get away from her family, get away from all that stuff. She says, money is poison. Maybe you know a lot of people whose uh, crutch is money. It's all about building that bank account. Does that ever go bad? Does that crutch ever break? <laughs> right? We just went through that big... 2007, 2008 uh, collapse, and a lot of people lost uh, a ton of money on that deal. A lot of people bought houses that were a little bit more than they really could afford, but, but what, what were they thinking? That, well, don't worry about it. We're, our finances will keep going up. I'll keep getting more income. Do you mind handing that back then? Mm -hmm. Thanks. And then what happened? They either lost their job or something happened. All of a sudden, houses started glutting the market. Uh, foreclosures were happening. Uh, some friends of ours are still what they call uh, upside down. Mm -hmm. 
you know, they worth their their house is worth less than all that they're going to be paying off, and they said they don't see any end in sight. So, is money a great crutch? I don't think so. We've all had uh, downturns and bad experiences when it comes to money. How about some other crutches? Relationships? Does that provide a wonderful crutch? Sometimes. Lifelong, it would be nice. But what's the divorce rate in this country? Around 50%? People entered this saying, that's going to be my crutch, right? That other person will always be there for me. Not necessarily. Sometimes it's death. Sometimes you know other things happen. But we don't always get 30, 40, 50, 60 years with somebody. Relationships come and relationships go. You remember when you were in high school and you signed things like best friends forever? <laughs> so you're laughing. You probably haven't seen those people in 30 years or 40 years. Uh, not everybody goes to reunions and reacquaints. Uh, and if you do, sometimes you're sorry you went. <laughs> They're different, you know, they change. Life's made some maybe improvements or differences in their life. Uh, so relationships, not always a, a great crutch. How about status? I just picked a picture of people who apparently are big wigs at their school, they're wearing their fancy gowns and stuff. Does does the status of people sometimes change in life? The ones you looked up to, not so much anymore, or vice versa? I always think of, of high school again for some reason. When you're in high school, some of the goofy, nerdy outcasts, and you say, I don't want anything to do with them, and later on, they've done very well for themselves, right? The status changes. <laughs> Then you got the jocks and the the you know most popular kids, and I remember years ago uh, I ran into a guy from high school, and I hadn't seen him in, in years. He was really funny in high school. I thought this is going to be great. I'm going to hang out with him and all. And he was real down. And it was like five minutes into that, I said, "Okay, I think we're done here." You know. Was, so I looked up to him. I thought he was a really neat guy. It was kind of like life had smashed him down just in a few years. So status can change, can it? Yeah. Isn't that like the same? Be nice to a nerd because you may work for him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, look, Steve Jobs never finished college and uh, Gates did, I don't think, finish college, right? So, yeah. So, big deal, huh? No, that's true. Michael Dell. Wasn't he doing it as part of a college project or something, working on computers? Yeah. <laughs> How about health? Right? When you're younger, you'll always be in good health. That's a good crutch to have. I, I'll be fine, right? I'm, I'm physically fit. Okay, I used to love running. And uh, my back says, no, not anymore. <laughs> So I got to think of something else because that gave me a lot of, that was my crutch, right? I would go out and kind of burn off some energy and felt really good doing that. So now I got to think of other things to do. So I'm more sedentary than I used to be. But you know thing, people like that, right, who've, who've built their lives around the physical fitness. And uh, they've been able to accomplish anything physically they wanted to do. And then things come into their lives. So we don't know, right? You can't, you can't tell that that's going to be there for forever. I thought I was going to run until I was 80, 85 because I'd see some of these old guys, spry guys out running on the streets. I thought, great. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a hard hard thing on your back when you're pounding along the pavement. How about education? We've kind of touched on that already, but is education the crutch that we can always depend on? I forgot what I read. The statistics were just startling. People who have finished college, it's something like a third of them never get into the field that they majored in. Maybe you know people like that. They've uh, spent a lot of money on college. It's hugely expensive these days. And then they're not doing what it was they were trained to do because there are no openings. Or, you know, whatever, something's happened. They got that degree and they thought that was going to open every door. And for some people it does. It's still, you know, statistically you make more money if you don't, if you have a degree compared to those who don't. But you're, you're taking on huge debt and sometimes you don't get into the field. Sometimes the money isn't there. People major in things that will not provide them that kind of uh, money. <clears throat> I hope education works out for people, but not always. So what I wanted to do is to have you take a look at this list uh, here for a minute. What we've been hearing over and over again is, well, Christians are psychologically weak. And I would add to that, there's some other personal attacks made on Christianity. Well, Christians are homophobes. I mean, that's one of the latest... Uh, Christians are arrogant. They think they got the right way. 
Christians are intolerant. They say there's only one way to G- through Jesus to God. Uh, Christians are judgmental. We say, oh, that's not right, that's immoral. And so these kinds of charges get leveled against us. What if you hear this? So today it was, you know, you Christians, you think uh, God's a crutch. Uh, you're psychologically weak. So maybe you hear that, maybe you hear these other things. So I'm just lumping them together because I think there's one really good answer that we can give. Anybody have an idea about this? What, what would you say? I, I'll just tell you this uh, before you, I hear your answer. The tendency is going to want to say somebody calls you intolerant, you're going to try to prove that you're tolerant, right? Or somebody says you're a homophobe. No, I'm not. Uh, you know, I've got this good friend down the street. We do a lot together, and that person's uh, gay or uh, lesbian or something, right? So we're busy trying to defend ourselves against these attacks to prove that they're not true, which is hard to do, right? You've got to somehow mount some evidence. There's an easier approach, I think. Yes. Yeah. So I want to give one, and maybe it'll match up. Yeah, well, that's okay. Somebody, they're probably more. Just accused me. It was at a secular get- gathering, and I never even brought up my religion, but he knew. And he said, "You're part of a cult that will oh, um, lead cult. you to the lemonade, you know, or to the Kool Aid, Kool Aid, Kool Aid." James and Jones, you guys remember? He started attacking me. Everybody was a little shocked. It was a bunch of retired teachers. Actually, ah, <laughs> and I said, Pete, how about judging me by what you see by my actions? <laughs> Different Pete, right? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I said, um, do, judge me by what you see. Yeah. Do you see bad things from me? And he said, no, you're one of the nicest people I know. I said, well, there you go. <laughs> see, that, that's a great response, right? If that, that works if they know you. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, right. In some cases, they may not know you, and right. they'll slap you with this label as well. So, yeah. How about just saying, yeah, I agree. You know, I'm all those things. I'm not perfect. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm a Christian. I'm not perfect. Yeah. So, do you see where he's going with this? Because I think this, this works really well. Right. Maybe I'm all those things. But did that answer this question? Okay, you're intolerant. Okay, maybe I'm intolerant. Let's get back to the issue. I think Jesus lived. I think he uh, said the things he did. I think he really died. I think he really was resurrected. I think he really is the only way to God. Label me what you want. Intolerant, uh, stupid, psychologically weak. You still haven't dealt with the argument. Is there a God? Can we trust the New Testament documents? Did Jesus really live? Did he really say those things? Did he really rise from the dead? Do you notice that that labeling allows the person to say, I'm done with you. I don't have to listen to you anymore. And they walk away. But you say, wait, come back. right? So you labeled me. I'll take it. Go, I'll go ahead. Give me the label. Let's get back to the issue. right? This is the big issue. Does God exist? And here's where you're on really, really good ground. I'm just going to go kind of quickly over these five things because of uh, time here. You're on great ground if you get it back to the argument rather than what am I? Oh, I'm really tolerant. Let me prove it to you. You don't have to prove any of those things. Now, you can because the person knew you, so that's nice. But you say, I don't have to prove myself. Let's get back to the issue. Quit labeling. Let's talk about is there a God or not. So here are the five things. The start of the universe. Scientists today think the universe exploded into existence, which this illustrates, right? And we got the galaxies, and we got the planets, we got the stars, and and all that kind of stuff out of this initial explosion. Why is that actually a good thing for Christianity to say that there's such a thing as the Big Bang? How does that? Most Christians are a little suspicious of science. They think science is out there to ruin Christianity. This is a great help. How is it a great help? Because who's the big bang? Yeah, if the universe came into existence, that means that matter, space, time, energy all started. That means that something had to get it going, but that something can't be the universe itself. It can't bring itself into existence, right? You didn't bring yourself into existence. Uh, the car didn't just pop into existence, right? People had to sit there in a factory somehow and put the car together. So how do you get the universe to start? Well, it's got to be outside of matter, space, time, and energy. That's called supernatural. Right? So whatever it is, is outside of the universe that brought it into existence, spins right. If there's a big bang, what's the big banger? Right? What brought this thing about? Yeah. And, that, and scientists are really struggling with that because they don't have an answer. We do. Right? We say there was an intelligence behind this. 
And by the way, this, this thing that looks like an explosion, people think of it kind of like somebody throwing a grenade. It's not that kind of explosion. The universe ex expanded just right to be able to cre create these galaxies, and it had to have the right features about you know, how much gas was out there and what kinds of stars could form and how far apart they should all be. And all this kind of stuff as part of this was a very controlled explosion. It's not just random pieces flying all over the place. So that suggests way more than just accidental bang, things got started. It was controlled. If it's controlled, there's a mind, there's an intelligence, there's a power out there that was shaping this universe as it came into existence. So there's a good argument right there. How did the universe come about? We say, in the beginning, God. Right? First four words of Genesis. We're on good ground there. Science is with us, which is kind of neat. And some scientists, frankly, were, were drag kicking and screaming into this position. They didn't want there to be a Big Bang. One scientist said, the idea of a Big Bang is repugnant. Why would it be repugnant? Because he didn't want this to happen. Because if this happens, then he's got to figure out, all right, who lit the match? You know, how'd you get this thing started? So we're on really, really solid ground there in this area. Here, here are three or four other ways that we can think of arguing for the exist, existence of God. This is not a biology class, so we're not going to sit here and agonize over all the things up here. But this is just a cross-section of a typical cell of a small creature, like a bacterium, that floats around through the water here. It's got, and they, they cut it off because they didn't have enough space, but many of the bacterium have these little whip-like things that spin them through the water, like almost like an outboard motor. So they've got that. They've got a nucleus of a cell. They've got all these little bits and pieces here, and I won't even label them and have you worry about them, but... How in the world do you get life started when even the simplest single cell is this complicated? Do you think just random you know, things fly around through the universe and just kind of stick together and give yourself a cell? It, it doesn't happen. This is as complicated as a factory. They, they talk about a cell as a factory. What's going on inside there? All sorts of little things to keep that factory functioning. They've got little highways that are created. They've got little... Uh, Creatures that move things back and forth, they get rid of things they don't want, they're producing new things, and it can replicate itself. I don't know any Toyota factory that can replicate itself, right? We're not smart enough to do that. So all of this stuff leads you to think, good heavens, if it's that complicated, how can you get life? So they're having two problems, right? First of all, the scientists can't figure out how you get the universe started. And once you get the universe and you get the Earth, how do you get life going on the Earth? They're, they're discovering life happened really early. After the earth was just about ready to have life, boom, life was there. And they don't, they don't understand it. How can you get life started that fast? You don't have enough time for random processes to happen. It happened too quickly. There's something called the Cambrian explosion. I don't know if you heard about that, but it's all of a sudden a whole new layer of animal life appears. Suddenly, in the, you know, snap of a finger, it's there. How does that happen? That's not the slow process that you need for evolution. So we got two things on our side. If we're going to talk to people about do we really think there's a God, how about the beginning of the universe? How about the beginning of life? Here's a third one. How about the design of life? I already showed you the cell. So if you took the cell, right, you've got the cell here, and you go inside the nucleus, and you pull it apart, and you see these kind of funky little uh, strings that look all wound up. That's chromosomes. If you took the chromosomes, apparently there are about six feet of them, you know, in the inside of each cell. And then if you take that chromosome and you look at it closely, it wasn't until the 1950s or so that they discovered it has this uh, called a double helix structure. It looks like a ladder, but you've twisted it. And inside the ladder are these chemical compounds. You notice they're using different colors to represent. They're not the same thing. And they come in a sequence. And you know what this is? If you pull it apart, and read it, it, it's a computer language. So you've got language inside these cells. In other words, what this is basically saying is, if you take enough of these and string them together, you can make brown hair. Then the next part of it, if you string these together, you'll make blue eyes. You string the next part of these together, you get a kidney. You string the next part of these together, because you've got six feet of it, right? And so you're reading the information. If, and as you read this information, it tells you what to build. It's a blueprint. Now, I don't know about you, but blueprints in my book always come from engineers and designers, right? How else do you get computer language? It's coders, right? People that code these things. Bill Gates, does he know something about computers? Bill Gates said DNA is the most complex 
computer code ever? Bill Gates. Does it mean he's a believer? Probably not. But he recognizes this is information, right? This is language. And this is coming out of the, every cell that we have. Well, how does that happen? How do you get this kind of specificity out of a random process? There's design, right? That, that is careful designing to create information that'll give you a form of life, whatever it is, a giraffe, a person, a, a amoeba, Pete? You know, when I read the um, intelligent design book, and I'm trying to remember something, there seemed like there was something about Darwin's black had, box by huh? Darwin's black box? Well, no. I don't know about Darwin's black box, but it was, it was, it was a book that, on um, it. Was, it was intelligent design, that's okay. the name of the book. It was um, Josh McDowell's son. Oh, yeah, Sean did one. Sean that's McDowell. right. But I think it said there, there's more, more code or more uh, information in, this, in the DNA in our bodies than, than all these text. I mean, thousands and thousands of textbooks. It's just yeah. a wealth of information, you know, information in our bodies. Yeah. It, it just, you know, blows your mind. Oh, it does. Yeah. It's it's like you you're walking around with sets of encyclopedias on the inside. Uh, you know, of information, how to, how to build this. Put these things together, these proteins, right? It's telling you how to build proteins. Put these proteins together and you'll get X. Put another set of proteins together, you get something else. And this is going on inside the cell. If you want to see a representation of how it actually gets carried out, there's a really good DVD called Unlocking the Mystery of Life by a, a company called Illustra, I-L-L-U-S-T-R-A, Illustra Media. It is so fascinating because they computerize it. It's not just like I'm doing today slides. If we had enough time, it's called Unlocking the Mystery of Life. So what they do is they show you this little DNA thing, except it's three-dimensional. It's really good computer graphics. They show you these two outer strands being pulled apart. They show you the RNA coming in and taking the information, going off in another part of the cell. It goes inside this body that that reads the information and starts building the proteins. It shows you the whole thing. You watch it, you go, that is unbelievable. It's just beautiful to, to see it is all it, happening. Is that a DVD? It's a DVD. And you can share it with friends, by the way. It's not, it's not threatening. It doesn't say, come to Christ or you'll burn in hell. It's not one of those <laughs> kinds of things. It, it just says, amazing. And, and even a non-Christian is going to say, yeah, I agree, it's amazing. So it's a great conversation starter. Really, really good. They have a whole series of these DVDs. Unlocking the Mystery of Life is one. Another is uh, Darwin's Dilemma. A uh, third one is... Uh, the Privileged Planet. The Privileged Planet. Who puts these out? Illustra. I-L-L-U-S-T-R-A. Illustra. Media. I-L-L-U-S-T-R-A. T-R-A, right. If you forget any of that stuff, just email me. Just say, what was that thing about that DVD? I'll give you the link to it. And they're really cheap. It's like uh, they have packs of them like you can buy three for 10, 15 bucks. You know, it's pretty reasonable. And I'm, I hand them out like candy because I think they're so interesting. And nobody's going to disagree with you, right? But it's oriented towards science. Everybody loves science these days. So they read that or, I mean, they watch it and they go, oh, that's pretty cool. And then you get a great conversation to start. How does that just happen? They've also got DVDs for nature lovers. they got one on flight. That's what it's called, flight. The, how do the birds function? You know, everything about them from their uh, skeleton. and I mean, everything is just perfect for the way they're, they're designed. Right. Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis, yeah. How do you change one animal into a completely different animal like you get with uh, caterpillars to butterflies? They've got a new one called Living Waters. What's going on out there with uh, porpoises and things like that? They have the, the sound location, all that kind of stuff. It's amazing. Can you get so, through Amazon? What's that? You yeah, you can get them through Amazon uh, or go to Lustra's uh, website itself. But they're really, really good, good things to watch. Okay, so design. There's another argument. So beginning of life, oh, sorry, beginning of the universe, beginning of life, and then life itself is so complicated. There's such a design there. I don't see how... Oh, by the way, I knew there was one other thing I was going to say. Have you ever heard that term junk DNA? Mm -hmm. No. No? Okay, well, I won't spend my time on it. But at one time, when they started discovering DNA, they would come across section of DNA that didn't seem to do anything. And they said... Oh, that just proves that evolution created DNA because they had some dead ends as evolution was kind of, uh, you know, uh, making these things happen. And so they called it junk DNA. In other words, like junk, it's not worth anything. And they found pieces of it. Well, you know, in the last five years, they've been looking at it more closely. And are you surprised? There's no junk DNA. That DNA that they didn't know what it did, it does things. You need it. 
oops. You know, so there goes another shot against uh, Christianity. It's like, okay, so now you're not supposed to use the term junk DNA anymore because it's actually functioning. Here's another argument for God. Where in the world do we get the idea of morality if it's not from God? Well, the alternate is to say we make it up. Well, that's not a good way to live. right? We, every one of us, we're making up our own as we go. Well, why is it then when we stand in line in a grocery store and somebody cuts in front of us, we say, hey, that's not right. That person could turn around and say, well, that's your morality. My morality is to cut you off. We don't, th we don't think that. We say there is, there's something bigger than just me. So then other people say, well, maybe it's uh, morality comes from society, right? If 51% of people say it's moral, then it's moral. So my question is, well, how about 150 years ago? Slavery was okay by at least 51% of the population. Did that make slavery right? Uh, no. Hitler got in office by the election of the people, right? The majority of the people thought Hitler was okay. Is what he did okay? Uh, no. So you're really stuck. If you say there's no God, then where in the world are we getting this morality from? We all feel it down deep, don't we? We all say, yeah, it's wrong to torture babies. Yeah, it's wrong to genocide a whole bunch of people, take the Jews and put them in ovens. That's just wrong. That's not my opinion. It's not society's opinion. That's wrong. That's, there's some kind of morality beyond us, right? So we say it's God. One more argument. How about the argument of consciousness? How do, and I just illustrated with rocks, if the universe is just filled with stuff, in this case rocks, how does this develop consciousness? Right? When do rocks all of a sudden wake up and go, what am I doing here? <laughs> this is really a dull existence. I just got to sit here until somebody comes along or water washes over me. Right? So we laugh about that, but how do you get consciousness? This is a huge problem for people who are scientists but they don't believe in Christianity or some system that has a God. How do you get consciousness out of material stuff in the universe? First it was just hydrogen, you know, and then helium and, and some of that stuff fused. Pretty soon you got the bigger elements, you got uh, you know, iron and copper and all. But how does all of that stuff all of a sudden wake up and say, I'm me. I am a person. And you can introspect and you can think about things. You can worry about the future. You can plan the afternoon. How does that happen? From rocks. It sounds simple, but there's no answer outside of God. Yeah. And Gary, I thought about that, about that before, and I said to my atheist friends, evolution is true by the great chance that we did get here. I would argue that we would just all be zombies. Yeah, like exactly. Just kind of mindless, because you're where? Yeah, where do you get the consciousness part? Yeah. Where, where did that grow out of evolution? Yeah. <clears throat> It's the old argument, are we just a brain or are we a mind? Right? If we're just a brain and a bunch of neurons are firing and the chemicals are washing over us, we have no free will. Right? But if we have a consciousness, if we're aware, if we're actually a mind inside there, we can decide to do or not to do certain things. That gives us free will. So if you want to say, well, we're just all basically meat, right? we're just chunks of <laughs> organic material, you've given up a lot as a human being. Right? You're, you're really no different than a rock, except you can walk around. Even your thoughts, you didn't, you didn't really think of that stuff, it's just the chemicals firing. So these are hugely good arguments, I think, for the existence of God. So what's the key point here? People can have psychological reasons for beliefs. Yeah, we, we've talked about that before. They can have psychological reasons why they reject God. They can have psychological reasons why they would accept a God. What we need to do is to see, are those beliefs rational? Do they make sense? So let me end here on, uh, you know what, maybe I won't. Uh, it's a, uh, shoot, I'll come back and we'll do it again. Or I'll, uh, tell me and I will, uh, send me a note and I will uh, get you a link to this. But it's a, a guy I like a lot, Greg Kokel, who has also come to Manual Faith. He's a really good apologist. And he talks about this whole issue. And I was just, I want to give him credit because much of what I've been doing today I learned from Greg Kokel, and I thought, well, this would be appropriate, because he talks about the same issue, about this psychological crutch, but I don't want to run you over here. So, anybody have a question? I went past a lot of material again today. Just yeah, a, Dave. Just another thing, you know, going back to those questions, for, um, statements, Christians are judgmental and tolerant. You know what I've found over time that those people are just as intolerant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One more shot. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like they've They've kind of turned it around to 
I mean, this has been over the course of about 30 years, it seems like, but yeah. let's, let's defuse Christianity so that we can bring our own intolerant and judgmental views yeah. to the scene. Mm -hmm. Oh, exactly. Do yeah. Do you feel that, too? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There was a really good article that you sent out a few years ago as part of your apologetics group um, called The Intolerance of Tolerance, mm -hmm. and that speaks exactly to that point. It's mm -hmm. such an interesting article. It's a real quick way to diffuse that kind of argument when they say, well, Christians are so judgmental. What did they just do? They judged mm -hmm. Christians. Mm -hmm. In fact, I had, uh, I don't know if I told you this story before, I had a friend that said he went to work one day, this is years ago, and he, he was doing his thing, and this other co-worker comes in real flustered and upset and says, I hate intolerant people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said he bit his tongue, cause he, <laughs> but he wanted to say, Gosh, that sounds intolerant, you know. But, I mean, people are not even aware of these things. They're self-destructing by making those kinds of comments, right? Their, their comment is just absolutely opposite from what they're saying. So, yeah, the intolerance thing, I would suggest the people that are uh, the ones that want to shut us up are the ones being intolerant. So, we'll see. Well, I mean, look, take a look at the whole same-sex marriage thing. I know the heads is off in a different direction, but what are they doing? They're going to bakers for example, and saying, bake me a cake that celebrates my gayness. And the baker says, no, but I'll tell you some other good bakers you can go to. No, they want to come down and, and, and oh, yes. crash land on that baker and sue them and take them out of business. Well, what, where's, where's the tolerance there? Just say, okay, I'll get somebody else to do it. You don't get my money. Fine. But they don't do that, right? They're, they want to hurt people that disagree with them. Right. So it's not this open-mindedness that they talk. Yeah. The new bully on the block. It is, yeah. That's a good way to say it. That's a good way to say it. That's why they're working so hard all the time to try to get judges to come on their side because then they can rule from a small you know, nine-person court to change everybody's opinion. And the, the tolerance issue is, is one way they do it. They talk about, let's all be tolerant until they're in power. <laughs> and then right. it disappears. Okay. Well, let me close, and then um, I gave you a note, by the way, at the bottom here. You can contact me at zax at cox.net. Uh, you can read a book called Faith is Not Wishing by Greg Kokel. He has a chapter devoted. It's, it's like ten real short chapters to read. One of the chapters is, is Got a Crutch, but a lot of good chapters in there. Uh, and then there's Sean McDowell again. He wrote a book with another guy called Is God Just a Human Invention? And he deals with this crutch idea as well. So uh, thank you all for coming. And